This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We are glad that you are here with us in this virtual worship space. We are happy to praise our risen Lord this morning. Hello, my friends, and welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of this opportunity to engage in a new sermon series. We simply call it What's Next, based on the theological theme of discernment. What is discernment? Discernment is really trying to make good decisions led by the Spirit of Almighty God. Many of us make decisions every day of our lives, some with God, some without God. So in this series of sermons, we invite you to join us weekly so we can explore what does the Bible say about making solid decisions based on the spirit of the sermon. This week, we're going to be talking about making decisions to serve others. And who are those others? That whoever God puts in your path. So please join me right here at the C.N. Jenkins website, also at YouTube and on Facebook on Sunday mornings, as well as uploaded through the week. This is Pastor Cannon. Thank you so much for being a part of this ministry.
Amen. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You're worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. What an awesome God we worship. Thank you, Dr. Monroe. Thank you, choir, musicians. We praise God for our AV team. We thank God for our floor director. We thank God for the centurions and others who make this a great place and a safe place to worship. We bid you guys joy on this first Sunday of a new month. We bid you guys joy as we launch into a new series of sermons, but knowing that we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. Won't you help me thank God again for the Holy Spirit? It is here in this space, and we give God praise. In your living room, uh, on your couch, in your car, uh, some of you are vacationing over this holiday weekend, and we thank God that you've tuned in, uh, either sharply at 9 o'clock or sometime during the holiday week. We're grateful, grateful for the spirit of worship. Join us as we pray now. Eternal God, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. And we are grateful, God, on this Sabbath day that you've already spoken a word to us. Now, God, I pray that you will take the words that you've placed in my heart and may they come across from my lips, God, to the people to which you prepare to receive them. Thank you, God, for making us better today than what we were on yesterday. We pray now, God, that someone will indeed hear your word and receive the invitation to follow you as their Lord and Savior. You ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be the glory, great things God has done, is doing, and promises to do along the way. This morning, if you have your word, I invite you to turn to a very familiar pericope from the Bible, Luke chapter 5. I want to read to you verses 1 through 11 from an NIV translation of God's holy word. That's Luke chapter 5, reading verses 1 through 11 from a new international version of the word. Let us hear God's word. Now, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, the he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the net. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men and women. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And with your encouragement today, I want us to focus in on verse 11 of this pericope because it serves as the backdrop, but also the starting gate from a new series of sermons to which we are preaching and teaching starting this first Sunday in July on the spiritual gift of discernment, discernment, the spiritual gift uh, to which we will be teaching uh, through the month of July and maybe going into August, but today I want us to look at verse 11 of this chapter, for it says, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And with the aid of the Holy Spirit, I want to lift up this text, and for a brief moment, I want to preach on our subject, what's next? What's next? Call to serve others. My friends, making decisions and following through, for some folk, that is an easy task. And for others, making decisions and following through, that can be a very difficult time, if not nightmarish at all. 
for recognizing uh, that one act often leads to another and understanding that you and I never come to the crossroads unless we ever get on the road. I want you to recognize y'all that I think it would be safe to say that based on the outcome and evaluating the end results, uh, making decisions for some is easy and making decisions for others can be a nightmare. If you agree with me, say amen. If you know it's a nightmare, just say ouch, whatever you want to put in the chat box this Sunday morning. Let me see if I can illustrate this point to you about decision making. For I don't know if you recall, but two years ago, last July, here in Charlotte, North Carolina, Sandra Adams went out for a daily walk, something that she did and does on a regular basis. But this daily walk that usually took about an hour, y'all, extended beyond an hour. It went into the day. It went into the night. It went into the next day. And her family got alarmed because Sandra Adams, 69 years old from Charlotte, North Carolina, was lost. They called the fire department. They called the police department. They, they, they called the news stations and they began to seek and search for Sandra Adams here in Charlotte, North Carolina. One day, two days, three days passed. We did not know where Sandra was. And on the fourth night of, the, of her being away from home, the fourth night, her grandson was reminded in a dream to go look for his grandmother in the woods. And the next morning, on the fifth day, Sandra Adams' grandson with another friend and two others, they got together, went to her apartment, went behind her apartment in the woods looking for their grandmother grandmother and to their surprise they found her but when they found her she was face down in a creek they thought that she had been mized they did not recognize her at all but then they called the police and as the police came to look at what they saw in the water Sandra Adams raised her hand let me help you Sandra Adams lost for five days y'all was found because of the decision of her grandson to not give up and not not give out, not to give in, but to go look for grandma. Okay, you didn't get it. Sandra Adams y'all, was lost. The news was there looking for her. The police, the fire department, volunteers, but they could not find her. But her grandson had a discerning spirit. Her grandson had a, had a commitment not to give up. Her grandson says, I'm going to find a grandma. And sure enough, praise be to God, they found Sandra Adams. She was weak. She was tired, but she was alive. I think I'm talking to somebody on this first Sunday of July because God has sent me by here to tell you, you may be weak, you may be tired, but you are still alive. God wants you to know that the year is halfway gone, but it's also half in front of us. You may be weak, you may be tired, but you are still alive. Is there anybody watching on this Sabbath day who is grateful to be still alive? You came through January with your first shot. You came to February with your second shot and you were so happy by the middle of March that you were free and go, oh, can I get help somebody? You got your first shot in March, your second shot in April and you couldn't wait till Memorial Day because you were free and alive. Okay, you didn't get your shot yet, but you're on your way to get your shot and you are still free and alive. If that's not your shout this Sunday morning, can you thank God for allowing you to see January, February, March, April, May, and June. Can you thank God that you are a living testimony of 2021? Can you thank God on this Sabbath day as God gives us another day and another opportunity to give God holy praise that you are free, you may be tired, you may be weary, but you are still alive. Oh, y'all, the good news, the good news. We serve that kind of God who has a discerning spirit and gives us that discerning spirit that never gives up on us. We serve that kind of God that reaches back and always goes, sends another a search squad to find those who are lost. 
We serve that kind of God, my Christian friends, who is who is sitting high and looking low, looking beyond our faults to meet our needs. And God says to, to us on this Sabbath day, you may be tired of what you're doing. You may be weary in where you are, but thanks be to God, you're still alive. And anything that God puts life in, God gives a purpose. Let me see if I can help you on this Sabbath day understand what I'm singing, because this spirit of discernment, this focus that we're looking at for the month of July, y'all, is something I believe God is want this congregation and those watching to really lean into and grab and learn about the spirit of discernment. We learn about that from Paul's writing to the church in Corinth when he gives these gifts of the spirit and one is discernment and discernment, my friends, I want you to recognize what it is it is ability to make decisions, godly decisions inspired by the Holy Spirit. But now let me say before I talk about this sermon that anytime there are decisions made, God is in the midst. Okay. Anytime a decision is made, God is in the midst. Now, as a believer, I want God to be on the side of the blessing of that decision as opposed to judgment. OK, am I the only one who's ever made some decisions and then I ask God to get on board what I decided to do? Now, I want you to know God was already on board. You just didn't listen. OK, it's a mic on. God was already involved in your process, but sometimes we are so personal personal and we're so selfish that we omit God. You see, it's been my experience, y'all, that signs follow decisions. Okay, it's my experience, my friends, that the way you overcome spiritual inertia is to put something into action. And the good news that God has shown me during the time of pandemic and the time of quarantine and now in the time of vaccinating. Oh, that was pretty good. You know, what God has shown me, y'all, is that there has to be some action behind my faith. You can no longer sit around and to talk about how good God is if you don't show how good God is. You cannot profess that God makes a way out of no way. And if you are not making your way toward the house of God, you cannot talk about that God can lift you up if you always want to be down. You have to have some actions behind your faith. And y'all, the tougher the decision, the more potential momentum it produces. OK, the tougher the decision you make, the more potential of God's blessings coming upon you. You know what it's like when you have a rubber band and you take that rubber band and you pull it back. Now, if you pull it back just a little bit, it will indeed uh, expand. But you pull it back way, way, away, away far about it. It has a way of holding more, but the tension is there. God says, I want to stretch your faith. I want to stretch your walk. I want to stretch your belief so that the tension, not the tension of with me or against me, God is saying, but the tension to be with me is greater. Why? Because God wants to put that heavenly rubber band around all of us to draw us closer to God. Discernment, y'all, is how we do that. Discernment, discernment. Here it is. Discernment It's the ability to judge well discernment, the ability to judge well. And in Christian language context, it is the word uh, that may, it may mean, it, it means different things, Pastor Lanson, but particular, primarily discernment from a Christian perspective, y'all, describes a process of determining God's desire in a situation for one's life. Okay, let me back it up and say it again. Discernment as a Christian is a process of God describing the next move in your life. Discernment, y'all, can also mean identifying situations coming to a conclusion, whether they are good, bad, or evil. You see, God never gives us discernment in order that we may criticize, but God gives us discernment so we can intercede. Oh, I think I'm talking to somebody right there because you have been blessed to intercede on behalf of those that you love in a marvelous way. And it's only the power of God that gave you the ability to intercede. Somebody watching on this Sunday morning can give God praise for that spirit of this sermon. You made the phone call at the right time. You made the drive by at the right time. You, you sent the letter in at the right. Okay, it's not what you did. Let's talk about 
start the sermon on somebody else's part. Somebody rung your doorbell at the right time. Somebody told you to stay home and because you stayed at home, you did not fall into the trouble that was waiting for you in the streets. Somebody took a sick day and because you took a sick day, the trouble at the work didn't come your way. Somebody can say, I'm grateful for the spirit of the sermon, even the, the spirit that I gave or the spirit that was given back to me. The spirit of the sermon, it helps us make godly decisions at a godly time. And it's the simplest way to define it, y'all, is that God wants to speak to us as we speak to God. And the way you get the spirit of discernment is spending time with God. Okay, the way you get it, Minister Donna, is that you have to spend time with God in order for God to spend time with you. It's not that you could get the spirit of discernment in a microwave. You have to spend it in the crock pot. Okay, y'all old school know what I'm talking about. You, if you know anything about crock pot cooking, you know you can, you can just put whatever you want in there in the morning and cut it on low. And in the evening, if you got enough onions and garlic in there, it's going to smell like something. I don't know what it's going to taste like, but it will indeed smell like something. Now, discernment, y'all, it comes through time. The sermon, y'all, it comes through processes. The, the sermon, y'all, it comes through experiences. And I believe that God is speaking to us today, that God is saying, I want this body that is called by my name to go through a process of discernment to find out where we're going next. Yes, it's the first Sunday of July, but it's also the first Sunday of the next six months of this year. Yes, six months have passed. We have six months in front of us before we have watched night service here at the church. Yes, we have six months behind us, but it's in front of us. I got to give the quote from Bishop T.D. Jakes about what's in front of you because he says, everything that I am looking for is in front of me. Okay, y'all y'all, y'all, real tough with me on the, on the screen this morning, so let me give it to you again. Everything that I'm looking for, Bishop Jakes says, is in front of me, meaning that he is looking through a spirit of discernment. It's not that you want to go backwards in life. You want to go forward. And going forward means you need Christ to direct you. What we find, Dr. Moreau, in Luke chapter 5 is a familiar passage where Jesus has really given the disciples an opportunity to go forward. We know this as one or two of the miracle fish stories in the Bible where Jesus is working with the disciples who are fishermen but they're not catching anything. So since they're not catching anything and they have fishing boats, Jesus says, well, let me use your fishing boat since you ain't fishing with it and I can carry out the gospel that God has placed upon me. Somebody hear what I'm saying this Sunday morning because if you don't use it, you will lose it. You see, God has blessed you with a gift and by God's grace, I pray that you've been warming it up and you've been polishing it up and you've been getting it ready so when we do come back in person, you can share that gift. But don't wait to come back into the building to share your gift. God has given you some opportunities in the last 16 months to bless somebody else's life. God has opened up doors for you to share, for you to listen, for you to be, for you to give, and for you also to receive. Jesus is saying since y'all got some boats and you're not using them for fishing, let me use your boat for the gospel that I want to preach. Somebody hear what Jesus is saying? That you have to have a spirit of discernment because God is getting ready to do something new in your life that God hasn't done before. God is about ready to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, not so you can build up your bank account but so you can bless somebody else. God is about ready to open up a new avenue, a new entrepreneurship, a new scholarship. God is getting ready to drop something in your spirit and in your family spirit. There will be something new and something exciting, but it will not be done the way you've been doing it before. Ooh, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I want you to recognize as Jesus is speaking to these disciples, he's trying to help them realize, y'all, is that is that I want you to have abundant life. And what's surprising about this, Sister Valerie, is that some of us don't know what the scriptures say. Some of us think that Jesus says, I've come that you might have church. 
No, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it what? More abundantly. An abundant life is not just stuff. Abundant life is not just the materialism. Abundant life is joy. Abundant life is peace. Abundant life is being able to get a good night's sleep at night. Abundant life is being able to smile when your haters are talking about you. Abundant life is being able to give God praise in the midst of all the hell you might be catching or even dishing out. Is there anybody watching this Sunday morning want to give God praise for not life, but abundant life, abundant living, abundant giving. Ab Ooh, praise God with me because I think all of us are around today because God has given us abundant love. Oh, the good news, the good news in the text, y'all, is that God is trying to do some new things inside of us. And I'm just pushing it again that we have this spirit of, of this sermon. God is saying you got to have a spirit of cooperation as well. What you saying, Reverend? You see, it was only when Peter says, yes, I will use my boat or you use my boat to do your ministry that God is saying the same thing to C.N. Jenkins. I need you to have a spirit of cooperation with your boat. Okay, y'all saying, dude, we ain't got no boat. We got a building. I need you to have a spirit of cooperation with your building. You know, I found, I found, I found, and I don't want to confess too much. Pastor says I shouldn't say it, but yeah, confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. And, and y'all, as an old school, fourth generation Presbyterian, I, I'm traditional like nobody's business. But I found that some of my traditions during COVID just really didn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know who I'm talking to, but if you, if you got a tradition that you thought you could not live without in church world, go ahead and just type it right there in the chat box because it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You, you, you thought you had to buy some new Sunday clothes to go to church. And y'all been wearing them same pajamas for the last 16 months. Uh, watching me and Pastor Lanson and those preaching here. Yo, you, you thought for sure, you thought for sure you had to get your hair done. Had to get your hair done to come to church. And I ain't seeing what's on the other side of the screen, but I can imagine this. You thought you had to get your nails did. You had to get, you know, all this. You know, it's amazing what you don't have to do to praise God. It's amazing how God just comes in and shows up and shows out. You see, what I found is that exposure, again, exposure is the gateway, the gateway to greatness. And God has exposed this church in so many phenomenal ways uh, since March 20. Matter of fact, God started doing it in 2019, exposing us, giving us an opportunity to feed and to clothe. God started sending people to us, not who were just physically hungry, but spiritually hungry. God continues to send men and women who want to pursue theological education here. God blessed us with students this year as we celebrated. A couple of students didn't take three or four through three, four years to graduate, graduated early. God, God keeps on blessing this congregation over and over again. Why? Because exposure, y'all, leads toward greatness. And I'm grateful that on this Sabbath day, God is doing some exposing, exposing the opportunities and the possibilities. God is exposing somebody to a word that is a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. God is exposing somebody to some gospel music that will stir your soul. God is exposing and somebody, as Pastor Lanson said, to the history of what it really means to be African American and celebrate the 4th of July. Exposure, y'all, again, is the gateway to greatness. Here's what I want you to recognize is that you have to be so committed to God as these disciples were to let God use what God wants to use and God will bless you through God is all what God has already blessed you with if you let God use it in a different way. Let me back it up and say it again. You can not be so tied to what how things used to be to let God not bless you in the way God wants you to be blessed. You have to let go of your boat and let God use your boat for this time right now because God's getting ready the Bible says give you a boat load of fish so much so your boat's going to begin to sink. Your nets are going to begin to tear. Okay your nets begin to tear but your boats won't sink. You're going to get such an abundance that you, your faithfulness to all 
Almighty God is going to be exponential in such a way that God will not allow your boats to sink. They're going to go down in the water, but that's just a sign that God is still with you. God's with you. God's with you. God's with you. And, 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 and the reason God is with you, I believe, because God wants us to be with others. And that's what I want to really leave with you in this sermon this Sunday morning, that it's really about discerning how can we be with others. And you see, if we can be with others, Others, it's almost like what Bishop Jake says is that if your metal, if your instinct is your metal, then your destiny is your magnet. Oh, that was good. If your instinct is your metal, then your destiny is your magnet. It's going to always draw you to it. This, this congregation, uh, Miss Pam, is going to always be a church that's going to be identified with feeding those who are hungry. This congregation will always be a place, uh, Sister Loris, that will be, that we are a haven for people going through 12-step program. This congregation will always be a place uh, where the ladies from, from the Salvation Army, they know they can come and be accepted as a whole world woman. This congregation will always be your place, Pastor Lanson and so many others, where women will be affirmed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and can preach us as hard as any man or anybody. This congregation will always be a place where children will be accepted through the, 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 the things like, 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 uh, like, I kept, okay, okay, I got the, I got a, uh, what do you call it, senior thing? Freedom School, thank you very much. This congregation will always be a place where people will be affirmed by the word of Almighty God. And why? Because it's about others, 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 others. Let me, let me give them to you quickly. Why should we and why must we become a church to serve others? Number one, because we were created to serve. Discerning Spirit says, C.N. Jenkins, you've got to be about others because that's how you were created. Ephesians 2.10 says it this way. It is God, God's self, whom has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. We have been created to serve others others. Why must, we, why must we become this kind of congregation, Sister Margaret? It says, number two, because it proves that we belong to Christ. You see, if I want to be identified with somebody who is life-giving and life-saving, then I have to do the things that the one who is life-giving and life-saving does. If I want to be identified with one who gives hope and gives inspiration, then I have to give hope and give inspiration. Romans 7, 4 says it like this. It says you are part of the body of Christ and now you belong to him in order that you might be useful in the service of Almighty God. If you are not being used by God, you need to get on your knees right now and say, God, I want to be a part of you, but in order to be, to be a part of you, I must be used by you. Why, why should we be and why must we become a church of others? Number three is we, we serve God by serving others. We serve God by serving others. Okay, they didn't get it, so let me give it to you this way. When I preached this sermon several years ago, Miss Miller, what was pushing me to raise the question was, why were the disciples mending their nets? And I learned in my study, Miss Cynthia, that they mended their nets because they were catching fish. But that still didn't make a whole lot of sense. Because what I found out, y'all, is that the fish were caught in the nets, but the nets should have held the fish. But then I realized that the only defense that the fish have is their teeth. And because the fish are caught in the net, that means that the fish caught in the net were using their teeth to tear a hole in the net to get out. Work with me. The fish caught in the net were now using their teeth to bite a hole in the net. If the fish had been caught in the net, there would not have been a hole in the net. But if the fisherman had not thrown the net to catch the fish and been successful, there would not have been a hole that the fish ate in the net. Y'all not working with me. You've got to realize that success will always put a hole in your net. 
You're going to always have some work to do when you are successful. You're going to always have some repairing to do when you are successful. You are going to always have some mending to do when you are successful. That's why I like C.N. Jenkins. I, I like it because this church is a good church, but we got some work to do. This church is a powerful church, but we got some holes to mend. We got some holes to fill in. This is a good church. And guess what? When we buy it new, we buy it to be used. When we buy it new, we buy it to be given. When we buy it, we buy it to be blessed by the power of Almighty God. Anytime that you are successful, you're going to have some holes in your net. So if you want God to bless you, you're going to do some mending. You want God to bless you, you're going to do some casting. You want God to bless you, you're going to do some, some lifting. If you want God to work in your life, you've got to realize that success is always going to come with some holes. Oh, the good news, the good news, y'all, is that why should we be and become a church of service? Here it is. We owe God everything. God has been too good to you and too good to me not to give my very best back to God. God has opened up too many opportunities, too many avenues, too many resources for me to be selfish and selfless in my giving back to God. I got to give it back. You see, when you have a service to others, you, you understand that people will meet you, but also they will greet you as they met you. So you have to be careful how they greet you because they will only greet you, Brother L, as they met you. But when you're serving others, you are a different person. What you're saying, Reverend, it's like this. When people met me some years ago, I was from Kannapolis, but I wasn't a pastor C. N. Jenkins, okay? When people met me in college, I was still from Kannapolis, but I wasn't a pastor C. N. Jenkins, okay? You're not getting it. When people met me in college, I was from Kannapolis, and I had a college degree, and I went to ITC, but I wasn't a pastor C. N. Jenkins, okay? When people met me years ago, I was from Kannapolis. I was a college degree, and I had a seminary degree, Miss Philippa, and 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 and, and I, I pastored in 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 Washington D.C. But I hadn't pastored yet at CNT. Okay, so you know where I'm going. So when you meet me now, you don't need to remind me where I'm from. You don't need to call me a country boy. You don't need to call me somebody who is an undergraduate working on a degree. No, I know who I am, not because of when you met me, but because who God is working in me right now. Is there anybody want to give God praise right there? Not because of where you started, but where you are. Not because of how you had to come through, but where God took you to. We are always on a destination, always on a journey, going somewhere by the power of God. Why, why should we become? a ministry to others. Here it is. It's the best use of our lives. Best use of our lives. Let me see if I can illustrate it to you this way. Two men, same name, different outcomes. Two men, same name, different outcomes. I'm talking about the Wes Moore story. Don't know if you read that book, a phenomenal book to read for the summer. But Wes Moore, who is, who is a graduate of John Hopkins, a, a Rhodes Scholar, I served as a fellowship on the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, a, a, a decorated war a hero of Afghanistan. Westmore was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and was raised by a single mother. There's another gentleman named Westmore, also born in Baltimore, Maryland, raised by a single mother. But he is now in the Jessup Correction Sentence uh, Facility, serving a life sentence for participating in killing a police officer in Baltimore. Same name, two black men born in Baltimore, raised by a single parent. And the difference is not that one, quote, succeeded and other did not, but the difference is, is that the others that stepped into Wes Moore's life from John Hopkins and Rhodes Scholar and, and fellowship with Condoleezza Rice, the others who stepped in his life showed him how to be the man he was supposed to be. The others who stepped in 
his life, showed him how he's supposed to study. The others who stepped in his life did not step in the other Westmore life. Sadly, they say that the Westmore who's now serving a life sentence only, is met, only met his father three times. And the third time he met his father, his father looked up in a drunken stupid and simply said, who are you? You see, the others is so important. Why must we become a congregation of others? Because it's the best use of our lives. The, sec the next thing is that we also must make a congregation of others because it makes our lives meaningful. Meaningful, that is simply to say is that God is always in the process of doing things in our lives and we must be ready to respond to the way God wants us to respond. I like the way y'all, uh, that none other than Gracie, Gracie said it this way, Gracie Burns, the wife of George Burns, she says, never place a period where God has placed a comma. You know, that comes from Ephesians 3, 20, for it says, uh, now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly more great than I could ever imagine. You see, many of us right now, uh, we're trying to put a period and God just put a comma. No, we're not going back to church like it was in 2020. We're going to Christ in a different way. No, we're not going back to the way we used to do things on the job, but we're going to go forward to do a greater work for the Lord. No, we're not going to go back and think like we used to think in 2020. We're going to have a transformed mind, as Paul says in the word. Why? Why, why must we be a congregation to serve others? Here is the last one, and it's because serving will be rewarded in eternity. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus says, my father will honor the one who served me. Matthew 22, 21 says, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Why must we become a congregation that, that, that serves others? I got to give a close with Miss Emma Daniel Gray. Miss Emma Daniel Gray, raised by her grandfather, who was an enslaved African in South Carolina. She migrated with that great migration to the North in 1940s, and she began to work for the federal government. Miss Emma uh, Daniel Gray, y'all, and her husband were doing domestic work in Washington, D.C., and she was so good at her work, she was a identified in her service to others and she retired y'all after serving 24 years as the White House uh, or quit call her the charwoman C-H-A-R-W-O-M-A-N not the chairwoman but the charwoman why is that her name because it was her job she said as she cleaned the Oval Office she would put her hand on the chair of the chief of staff here excuse me that the commander in chief of the United States and pray over that chair you missing it right there. This woman served y'all 24 years as the charwoman for presidents going all the way from, 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 from the Kennedy y'all going all the way up uh, through uh, uh, through Ford and through, through Nixon y'all going all the way through Jimmy Carter. She said that was her favorite because she when she prayed over that chair she knew that somebody seated in that chair knew the Lord. Now that's just a different story of her all by herself. But this woman y'all is, is a historical figure on this on this Independence Day because of her service to somebody else. And I just want you to pray with me during this month as we preach and teach on this sermon that we look to how can we serve others? How can we serve others? Wow, that was a worship experience, communion, sermon, choir, all those things. But did you, and I hope you did, find something of interest? And I want you, if you did, please email us, call us, let us know how this sermon was helpful and hopefully impactful in your life. Continuing our series around the spirit of discernment, what's next? What is the next question that you need asked, answered by Almighty God? What's the next move that you ask God to make in your life? What's the next action that you want God to lead you in? Thank you so much for joining us on this first Sunday of July, first worship service. Thank you for being a part of our ministry of music, ministry of outreach, ministry of gift. Pastor Lance, and thank you so much for four years of ministry. I mean, outstanding, doing the thing, and keep on being what God calls you to be, a lamp to this world that needs to see a marvelous light. 
We thank you all for joining again on Facebook as well as YouTube. If you did not subscribe to us yet, please do so. Our AV team is doing a great job of putting up the services. Watch it several times. Send it to somebody. Share it. We want you to also know now, don't forget now, on tomorrow in the observation of 4th of July, we will not have morning prayer call, but we will start up on, the, on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we won't have it tomorrow, but we'll have it on Tuesday. But until then, we we love you. We pray God's blessings upon you. Thank you so much for being a part of this worship service. In the name of our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, we say have a wonderful Sabbath day. God bless you. We'll see you next week.